Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. What's up? Welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guest is Cal Dietz. Cal is the Director of Strength and Conditioning for the University of Minnesota. I learned about Cal when I was coaching at Southern Utah. As I came across his training method, the triphasic method, uh, I quickly fell in love with it and started using it on my track and field athletes and my soccer athletes. And today, it's something that we still use at Brute in the Brute Body Program, in some of our competitor programs in the off season. And so a good portion of the beginning of the show is just explaining what triphasic is and and explaining how adaptation works in exercise science and why this method is so valuable from an injury prevention standpoint, from a change of direction standpoint, from a, the ability to apply force. Uh, There are just so many benefits. And so we dive into all of that in the beginning of the show. We talk about how it applies to a variety of different athletes and different sports the difference between acceleration acceleration and deceleration training uh, and why that is why more people more athletes and coaches should be focusing on deceleration training we talk about whether or not athletes that throw right like throwers in in uh, field sport and pitchers and baseball players things like that uh, should really care about things like power cleans there's some new evidence that shows zero correlation between power development in the sagittal plane, right? Straight up and down and your ability to apply force rotationally. So we talk about uh, that topic a little bit. And then finally, we end with breath work, the power of the breath. I'm starting to hear, I've always heard you know, philosopher, not philosophers, but like kind of spiritual teachers talk about the power of the breath. But now we're starting to hear scientists and very, very high level strength and conditioning coaches and sport development experts talk about the power of the breath. So we talk about why it's important and how you can train it. Before we get started on this show, if you haven't done so already and you're interested in this, I've got something cool on the website for you. It is the top five most downloaded episodes of the show on a nice little PDF and we put all of the biggest takeaways from each of those shows. So these are practical things that you can take and use immediately and you can get access to that at brutestrengthtraining.com backslash top five. Enjoy the show. Cal, thanks for making some time for me today, man. Thanks to have me on, Michael. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I don't think I've mentioned this to you, but as a young strength coach at Southern Utah University years ago, I came across triphasic and my mind was just absolutely blown. And I immediately started implementing it with the soccer and track and field teams. And they saw amazing results. Uh, we use a lot of your methods in our business today. And the, you know, all of the tempo work just has an amazing effect on people. So I'm excited to dive into a lot of different things with you because you're one of the best strength coaches in the history of college sports. Uh, But I just wanted to let you know that you've had a big impact on me as a coach, as well as all of the athletes that I've coached. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know. Um, You know, I I actually don't know if I'm the best or one of the best. I feel like I'm always behind, to be honest with you, the way that Mm -hmm. I feel. So that's the mindset, you know, but but all honesty with the triphasic training concept, uh, you know, I've been blessed to to work with a number of sports. I tell people I've coached 190 seasons plus at the University of Minnesota because, you know, one year I was in charge of 12 different teams and we ran to our phasic. So we, we got to see, you know, things transpire and the results that we got. And uh, with that being said, you know, I, I couldn't have created this whole concept uh, myself. Uh, is a number of assistants that, that get, w- would be willing to give me feedback and, and we'd assess what we were doing and, and, and be willing to change things. And then the, the thousands of athletes that have been involved in it too, to be honest with you. And then, you know, I, I did work on it for probably 10 years or 12 before I even wrote about it. So, you know, it's not like I see some people nowadays write on a concept and, uh, 
have a concept and write about it and then maybe train some people with it versus I think I went the other route. I kept it kind of quiet. Right. About 10, 12 years later, I started talking about it and things transpired. And, and my big thing with triphasic, I think it's one of the most widely used concepts. And it's not just a program, as you guys know. It's a concept you place into your current program. And it may be one of the most widely used based upon the emails I get from all over the world, coaches all over the world saying, hey, thank you, and so forth. So, And then they're fortunate. I'm very fortunate enough to to get feedback and be exposed to those coaches, you know, where I have like a Hank uh, Cranoff come through the Minneapolis and spend a week in my home who was one of the greatest sprint coaches in the history of the world and won 17 Olympic and World Championship medals, and him and I get a chat for a week about training you know so that's i kind of geek out on that i mean that's better than a vacation for me yeah, you know what right. i mean i mean like hey you get to win a lot or spend a week with hank and i'm like well i'm gonna go with hank yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean something like that so if you if you haven't noticed guys he's at the university of minnesota i heard a couple of those o's in there that's for sure yeah i uh, i have been fortunate to uh, be here and I think I'm, I think I'm going on 18, 19 seasons full time. And I was a GA. So before that, um, yeah, I've been blessed to have great people, um, great support people around me that, uh, understand my willingness to get better and support me and, and let me do the things that I do. And, and, you know, just fortunate to be a part of a big 10 institution like this. It's, and then, you know, with the resources, cause I'll be honest with you, sometimes the resources, you have to have resources to figure out some of the things that I've figured out over the years. Right, right. So, I mean, I test a lot. I analyze a lot. I ask questions. Uh, I think the one thing that I do do is I ask more questions than most people. And I even ask them on myself because if you can actually look at your own program and say, Hey, this, I can do better. This is a, this is a bad job I'm doing. Then I can ultimately, Make the, make the program better and then push assistance. My, when I got better myself the most is when I've had assistants who who questioned me the most, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, And then push ourselves to get better. I mean, I have a long list of those guys because I realized if I didn't hire people that were going to question or, or think differently, then I don't know if I'd have got better myself, to be honest with you. You know? Totally hear you. I, I I see in the, I don't know if it's just the strength and conditioning community. I'm sure this is just in every industry. There are so many people that are, their egos are so fragile that they can't accept outside help. They, they think that asking for help or uh, appearing that they don't already have it figured out, it shows weakness or something like that. What do you think it is about you that kind of instilled that type of mindset in you because i do think it's unique in in this field yeah I, well the field's full you know egos is what drives people that's why they're sometimes successful right. but you know i've always been one to listen because i realize i guess i have a self-awareness that i'm not the expert in all these things you know what i mean so um you're sitting here going wow this guy's an expert i gotta figure out what it is you know what i mean that that that, that he's talking about mix it in integrate it with mine um, I don't know. I mean, what keeps me up at night is is missing something. Mm -hmm. What wakes me up in the morning is, you know, missing something, I guess, you know, so that, and, and, you know, and, and I talk about things or, or I'll hear somebody talk about a, a some method maybe and they, they say it worked. But for me, it's like, well, where's it work? When's it work best? Who's it work best with? And those are my things as a coach that I have to sequence in there and, and put in athletes. Because you get to my level and these elite athletes, a lot of them, you may find something that works across the board at a high school or a lower level college. But when you get to Olympic and, and professional athlete, you may use a method that actually makes them worse at that time of the year, at that time frame. So right, right. this is what you have to understand. If you can answer those questions, you're going to be fine um, as a coach. Uh, it, you know, it, it may not go with the status quo or the norm that everyone's talking about. Cause I, I do have some things that, that are completely against some of the industry standards that I think aren't correct, but uh, maybe we get them to them. Maybe we don't, but you know, ultimately I'm sitting here going, uh, I have to know if what gets results for this right. particular right. individual. So everything I tell you may, Dave, may not be true for some people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's what we have to be aware of. So I want to dive into triphasic and, and all of that stuff. But before we get started there, as I was researching you, I realized that you and your wife, Karen, are one of those couples that just got together so you could create superhuman babies. <laughs> you were a multi-time national champion uh, in football and wrestling and NAIA athlete of the year. And then your wife won two Olympics. Well, she got 
uh, gold, uh, gold and silver in the 98 and 02 Olympics, respectively. Yeah. So give me a little timeline of when y'all got married first um, in the, you know, in relation to your athletic career. And then what was that relationship like while you were both such high level athletes? How did you support each other? Well, yeah, I was, I was more or less retired out of college, uh, going to my, get my graduate uh, degree here at the University of Minnesota being a strength coach. And we briefly met. And then what happened was I, I wrestled with a defected uh, Soviet wrestler out of the Russia. And he, uh, he was dating the athletic trainer for the women's 98 Olympic team. And they got married. So then I went to the wedding and that's where I met my wife, Karin. And Karin had won a gold at that point. And then we started chatting and and uh, started dating. And I tell people, hey, after that, it went downhill because she won a silver in Salt Lake the next year. <laughs> so she reminds me of that. And any discrepancies we have in our family about uh, sports, she's always reminds me that she can't hear me because their Olympic medals are clinging together. In the background, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so the Trump happy. card, man. <laughs> yeah, Holy right, right. So then, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I think we're just thinking like it's, it's the same with my assistants. I, I think alike, my friends. I think alike, um, aggressive thinkers. She's also like that. And then um, I was able to during that next four years as we were dating, we were, uh, you know, we were apart most of the time. So that was tough. So actually, I was a strength coach at my alma mater, the University of Finley. I was fortunate to be able to work a lot, right? I mean, I go in on Sundays at nine and call her at maybe eight or nine o'clock at night, mm-hmm. and then go home. And that's what I did on Sundays, you know. So I could read, research, yep. and uh, so again, that was a four-year time frame where I'd read, you know. And I think my my library is well over a hundred thousand books and articles now. Um, it's mostly digital, but you're sitting here going. I had that time frame to get better. Then I came to the University of Minnesota, and she went through another uh, that hadn't finished the Olympics uh, in that time frame, but then finished in Salt Lake. And then we decided to get married and had kids right away. And you know, we're I have a twelve and a fourteen year old, so we uh, and they're, they're they're she's a not only was she an amazing athlete, she's also an amazing mother for me and for us and our children. So it's been great. Uh, she understands athletics and the coaching. Hey, why aren't you here the next? five Friday nights, right? Mm -hmm. Because I have a hockey game that I got to go deal with. You know what I mean? So, and, but you know, now that they're older, the kids are getting involved and, and with obviously all the sports, but you're, you're sitting here going, yeah, I mean, they can come to the games and appreciate them. So they're big fans that go for hockey's. Right. So it sounds like you were, you may not have been present for the, for her training, but is there anything that you learned from your wife, uh, as she prepared for those Olympics? Well, the first one I wasn't, then I, I trained remotely for the second one, you know, and uh, yeah, she was, I mean, I think she ended up pretty lean at 175 pounds in the one Olympics and then benched 240 for me, um, 225 for a double for a female hockey player when that wasn't our focus. So, um, I, you know, I learned a, a, about stress because sometimes she would be pulled in many, many directions and workouts wouldn't go well, you know. And it dawned on me that the stress thing is uh, is a pretty serious situation in regard. Even though she's an Olympic athlete and this is her main job, you're going, the stress that you're under can affect. I, I use this example, and a, a friend of mine also said this. Is, you know, if you if you lo- watch a busload of kids go by on campus, eight-year-olds or ten, and you look at them, they're jumping around, they're happy, they're enjoying. Then you see a load of adults go by, and it looks like they're going to the morgue because they have mortgages, they have bills to pay. And actually, I, I might as well tell a quick story with that one. So, for example, I have a $20,000 heart rate variability device, and I have multiple heart rate variability devices. But, um, and and I, my son went to a hockey camp with my wife, her hockey camp. And then the next t- next session, he jumped on with the older kids, wasn't supposed to. He basically skipped lunch. Then he goes in to the neighbors and, and goes swimming for about four or five hours. And we call him to come home to eat dinner. And we knew he was going to be cooked. So when he walked in the door, I, I laid him down for a three-minute test. And he fell asleep in that three minutes. He, he was too tired to eat. So and the machine says this kid, this person's cooked like they're done. There's no chance, right? That he'll be if he's an Olympic athlete, he's going to be recovered in a week, roughly. Right. So then he goes and goes to bed with no dinner, no lunch. Wakes up in the morning, I retest him, and guess what? Perfect. He's reason. good, hundred percent ready wow. to go. And it just tells you that kids. So my point with that story is, is that all this other stuff is the the mortgages and the the adult stuff wears you out. 
so it dawned on me that, hey, if you got an elite athlete, I got to make sure they don't pay their bills. They don't do stuff because that just wears people yeah. out. You know what I mean? Yeah. These kids are so resilient. They have an oxygen-based system, a, 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 I guess a more oxygen-based system for survival of the organism. There's a few things there. But, but you're sitting here, these kids can jump back really quick and adults can't so um yeah that's what it, the whole perspective of watching karn remotely in training and spending time with her brought to my attention at an early age you know i was probably 25 26 at the time yeah that's really interesting what was the transition for you going from an athlete to a coach uh what do you think helped you be, be a better coach and, and was there anything that maybe made it more challenging and i'll i'll, I'll give you this little caveat because i see a lot of really high level athletes that they're kind of like we were talking about strength coaches, their egos are something that make them really successful, but it also keeps them from uh, connecting with others, showing empathy and really having the, the care that it takes to be a great coach. Uh, so what was, yeah, what was that transition like for you and, and what was, what, what was helped you? What was challenging? I think the biggest thing that people have to realize that you're in this profession, I'm in this profession because we enjoy training, right? So, and then it dawned on me early that these these people didn't embrace training the way that we embrace training or somebody listens to this podcast probably. So yeah, there may be an Olympic champion out there that doesn't really like training, yep. but he's just doing it to win that gold, right? Or, or win a hundred, you know, make millions of dollars in the pros. You're sitting here going, okay. I actually was aware of that, right? I, it dawned on me that these people here do not want to train as hard as I did, right? So I think that's helped me, that awareness going, okay, just because they're an elite level athlete and then um, doesn't mean they're always going to work at the highest levels. And I, I was aware of that in college, but I thought, well, that just separated the good from the bad people, right? Um, but yeah, the egos these coaches come in and, and to reference the egos, they say, Oh, well, this is how I did it. And this was the best way. Well, again, that that's what worked for you and not, not the guy next door. You know what I mean? And, uh, there's rules and everything in regards to training and adaption. And it, it's pretty simple. So, uh, you know, the big thing I think too, is people have to realize, even if I train somebody with a method that doesn't make them better now, I might be setting them up to make them better later. Does that make sense? So I, 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 let's talk results versus adaptations. I may do a training method that if you're a sprinter, that might take you and slow you up for a period of three to four weeks. But when you adapt to that training concept and then reapply the stuff that works, you actually will get greater results. So at times I take adaption over results. And when you're dealing with athletes or various people, like, hey, I want to hit this PR and I, I, I just can't. Well, you and it's in an energy system such as, as lactate well you may have to go back and address aerobic based system so that you can then push your lactate farther and harder mm -hmm. does that make sense so that's you know in your gym I, I know you guys probably do that um but you're sitting here going people have to realize um nothing's written in stone in regards to various training concepts and methods and everything works it's just where with who's what and what's optimal what does that conversation sound like when you let's use the example of you're trying to make someone faster. What's the conversation sound like um, where you tell them you're going to be slower and then you're going to get faster? You know, I, I think they all, you got to use terms that they've used and, and that's part of the selling, which, which honestly I'm not really good at. I, I'm not very really great at selling myself. And, you know, so that's always been the struggle in this, this uh, field where I, I see, and well, good for them, but I see internet people that have, or can sell themselves better, but haven't really done too much. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or he claims to be an expert at a device, and the guy received the device, and I talked to the people that own the devices, and they said, well, he had it two weeks. And I'm like, wait a minute, he wrote an, exp he wrote an article that he's right. an expert on it for two weeks. And I've had stuff two years before I really get to the deepest levels, right? Um, so, you know, with all this, you're sitting here. I think that selling part is, is hard. So... You, with, a, with an athlete, you just got to look at what perspectives he's looking at. And then I go, okay, hey, we're going to try to build your base up so that we can get greater results later. And, and sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. But that's the frustrating thing because I may say it and then he, he's not buying in and then his friend says it a different way. And then the friend uses the right lingo and then he's bought it. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Yeah. But, but that's just what happens. And that's just selling with anybody. You know what I mean? I think day one. Right. Yeah, it is a little... It feels good to know that even even someone at your level has that same struggle, 
right? It's not, it's not a unique struggle. Everybody deals with getting buy-in from athletes because, you know, football players didn't sign up to go to the weight room. They signed up to play football. And so, uh, exactly like selling, selling the ideas, selling the, the principles, selling yourself is just a part of the equation and it's dynamic because everybody's different. And I, yeah, and I, I, I just not a big selling myself kind of guy, you know, some of my YouTube videos, I'm like, hmm. I know I just produced a YouTube video on the, which I think is one of the better lifts I've ever discovered, which is the single leg uh, safety bar split squat. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I started the video, I said, I'm going to smash my finger because I never thought I'd do a video like that, right? right. <laughs> you know, selling it. And, but I was just like, here, okay, I'm going to do this, but, uh, which is one of the better lifts I've ever dealt with just because of the adaption principles that take place. But I mean, you're just sitting here going, um, yeah, I just was never good at that. And so then you had to read some books on how to do it because there, there may be instances where your job depends on it. Yeah. You know, yep. and that's the hard part. Like all this stuff I've done, I've won. I think I've been fortunate to win uh, 34 Big Ten titles, 11 national championships since I've been at the University of Minnesota, trained 500 All Americans. And it's still times where I had to interview. I felt like I was interviewing for my job. You know what I right. mean? When I when I get a new head coach in and somebody, so you're like, wow, okay, well, we'll just go with it. Yeah. Well, it, it's a skill you have to have. You know what yeah. I mean? Whether you're uh, that communication in regards to selling yourself to some level or the products you're trying to, to get out there. Right. So I, I had originally planned to explain the triphasic in the intro to save you the breath, because I know you're just explaining this thing over and over and over, but I figured it would be a disservice to people that have never heard it, uh, to hear it from the horse's mouth. So what is, what is the triphasic method? Uh, just give us a little background on it. Yeah. Basically, if you want to simple and boil it down is, is really a series of tempos for, um, a series of six weeks, however you want to cut it, it can be extended longer or less, but it's uh, an eccentric focus. And when I say that, so when you're doing your back squat or your bench press, you lower it on the way down nice and super slow and controlled. And then you do that for a focus period of about two weeks. And y- you can get some results from one workout and some athletes will. But if you focus that period for two weeks, and then that's the first part of the triphasic. And then you, the next two weeks, you go to the isometric phase where you lower the weight down at a decent speed and then stop at the bottom. So it's, you're still holding it under tension and you work on the isometric phase, okay, for about two weeks. And then the next phase is the concentric where you just move it up and down fast. And that's basically triphasic in a nutshell. Now, The reason that it's gone so popular and people get results is they don't have to train, change their training program, right? That they, they're currently doing, they can just add that focus in of each of those weeks Mm -hmm. and, and use it in their current program. Nothing has to change. Some people do it in one lift. So they, they just pick their main lifts, right? So maybe it's back squat and bench during the week. And then other people where I do it with my advanced athletes, we do every lift eccentrically. Okay. And then the foundation of what happens with it, and I've I've never always released everything that goes on, but during the very first phase, the eccentric where you're lowering it down nice and slow, it's really a tissue remodeling. So what happens is the actinomycin head or in the muscle, it tears the muscle apart slightly and sounds horrible. Now, I mean, there's a there's an immune system response. The immune system, I mean, blood white blood cells go up. Um, the immune system responds, and then it comes up and cleans that up. But that muscle and that tissue becomes stronger and thicker now. Does that make sense? And then after it's become thicker and stronger and you've remodeled it, you go to the isometric phase where you're holding it in the weakest position, always in the down position where you're the most weakest, and it takes that new tissue and makes it more dense and stronger. And then when you go to move the weight up and down fast, you can now grab the weight or or stop the weight faster than you did before. And when you stop that weight faster and harder when you did before to reverse it, you apply more force with your tendons and your, in the, uh, all the stress in your body to shoot the weight up faster. And that's kind of what the foundation was. I just, basically I took two advanced athletes. One was a big 10 shot putter. One was world-class shot putter. They bench pressed the same where the strength, strength, same strength levels across the board, but they threw the shot put 10 to 12 feet apart. 
<clears throat> yeah. After and six I'm like, weeks. How is this? Well, no, no. They, they, these were two guys, and they, 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 they were ten feet apart in the shot put. Mm -hmm. They were same strength levels. Well, then when I analyzed them, I realized that the the guy that could throw it 62, 64 feet versus 55 or 53, he brought the weight down faster and could explode it up faster. So the separation in those two was the ability to handle the force when they came down. Right. Because that guy can actually even change directions faster when he did an agility drill. Well, people would say, well, he's a better athlete. But he has these qualities that far and exceed the guy that could only throw the shot put 52, 53 feet. Right. And there, and but the strength levels were the same. I'm like, okay, there's something here. So that's when, and people people ask me all the time, Cal. Can, well, can we do an eccentric on Monday and an ISO on Friday? You can do that, and you 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 will get results. But the downfall is that the body can adapt even greater if you isolate and focus a two week period on the stress that you're trying to implement. And you'll get better results that way. Because I've, I've tried triphasic every different way. And obviously it works optimally with the eccentric focus for two weeks, isometric focus for two weeks, and then the concentric. So what, what goes on in regular like concentric reps, just what most people know as, as lifting weights, right? Like a, a squat or a deadlift or a bench press, yeah. you're, you're still tearing up muscle tissue. So why does, why does eccentric tear up more muscle tissue and why does it restructure differently than just straight concentric regular reps? Yeah, right. So the eccentric is basically under contraction, right? So you're, you're, the muscle fibers have grabbed each other and then you're lowering the weight and they don't want to let go. And then basically they get torn apart at that point, the actin and myosin head. These are really small um, parts of the muscle and they get torn apart because that's what attaches together for the muscle twitch. And when those things get torn apart, that's the damage. And then the, the body comes in and, and basically you're really, and the same thing happens in the concentric phase. It's just, there's so much more in the eccentric right. phase and it's a focus. And then like, if you actually get into the deep stuff, which will be book five of triphasic training or four, it'll be the nutrition, right? So then, you know, I'll tell my athletes cause I can't give them, let's say bone broth collagen or the bone broth protein, but that's a perfect supplement to eat during the eccentric and isometric phases. Okay, so if I can't give them that, then I tell them to eat Jello mm -hmm. or like fried chicken because it has all the, the collagen. Yeah, yeah, so that'll exactly. Help, that'll help. Um, that'll help recover quickly, more quickly from the eccentric phase and the isometric phase. Yes. So specifically, bone broth, collagen, and protein, not not bone broth. Well, you can do the bone. They both work. Yes, okay. they're very effective. I I think. I think that's a superfood, in my opinion, is the bone broth and the uh, collagen. There's no Got question it. about it. Yes, yeah, we, we just deep. discovered it recently, and it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's just straight it's, protein. It's delicious, yeah, and, and it's just straight protein. Yeah, and then it's also the building blocks of, of all this stuff that we're mm -hmm. we're doing to our bodies, right? Um, it's it's pretty big time. What's the longest? you'd recommend or what's the limit on number of weeks in a row you can do each phase uh, you know what it just depends on how hard you're going right i would say three at the most four some people said they've they've gone four because they didn't do the whole thing like all the lifts yep. eccentrically um so I, but but a good rule of thumb if you're going hard and, and you know most probably people in your gym bust their butt right i would say about two weeks is your limit okay. and then it doesn't have to be in order and sequence that's the one thing people people uh, misinterpret probably because you can go eccentric and then two weeks of eccentric and then i'm going to go on a family vacation did i do i got to go back no you, you've got those qualities now so if you go on vacation you come back and then you do the isometrics that's completely fine gotcha. you know so it's not like it's set and, and then the other thing is people have to realize when you when you do try phasic like a lot of world champion power lifters when i say that people have set some world records or champions have emailed me said they, they've been able to use it and they asked me when they should use it or did they use it right? Well, you need to do triphasic. Let's say if you have an event on week zero, you probably need to do triphasic between weeks 12 and six. 
and then give yourself because what happens you deal you, you develop all this new tissue and all these high high level qualities you need to pr- practice your your skill whether it's a weightlifting competition or a crossfit competition does that make sense yep. and give yourself about six weeks to peak for that competition with those new quality and that's the most optimal that's kind of across the board with from from sprinting you know maybe a world-class sprinter i might push the triphasic a little farther out but any power and speed sport like you know, throwing shot putters. Um, and really, honestly, triphasic was built off two major both sports for me. It was track and field, which you're very relevant, you know, you're familiar with. And then swimming, because all these things are, are those are all measurable, you know. So, and and I've just been very fortunate to be able to work with those teams and, and have, uh, you know, chain, you know, been be able to train on world champions in those sports because, I'm very fortunate to uh, to apply it, and we saw instantaneous results. So it was, uh, you know, it it was it's quite exciting. Now, again, you have to realize though, during triphasic, my athletes at times would get worse times in the in the arena, and the coaches I had to inform them, hey, you, we we're going to do a very focused thing, and they may get a little bit worse with their times. And I was very blessed to have coaches like Dennis Dale and Phil Lundin, who were my swimming and track coach at the University of Minnesota, where we won numerous Big Ten titles, big goal. Okay, we understand, and but but later on, it'll get better, and and it did, and we were very, you know, so they, I was blessed, because sometimes coaches won't like that at all. You know how coaches are. Absolutely. I think they'll tight. They want to micromanage it. They think they're they, the expert. Yeah, and not that I was the expert. I just thought I maybe knew a little bit more, and they, they listened to me, and we were very good, and I think I did communicate that well enough. So... Um, and then sometimes it falls right into your hand because coaches go, hey, I want to kill him. I'm like, all right, I got this eccentric and isometric for four weeks. How's that? And they're going, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and, right. right. And then it just worked out. And then they're like, Cal, see, killing him helped. I'm like, yeah, it kind of helped. Right. Yeah. But it, there was a there was a reason behind killing them, not yeah, just yeah, yeah. not just killing them to kill them. You know what I'm saying? Or yeah. just developmental toughness, which is a whole nother, you know, people come to me and being a college wrestler, I was like, Coach would be like, hey, can you make our guys mentally tough like wrestlers? I'm like, coach, <laughs> wrestling never made anybody mentally tough. Tough kids stay in wrestling, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Same with Navy. Like, the Navy SEALs never made anybody tough. They just found the tough people that stayed in the Navy SEALs, right? And they right. may help you bring right. that out, right? They may help you bring that out, that toughness that you didn't even know you had. That's how Actually, that's a phenomenal point. I never really thought about that. It, 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 it attracts the mo the people with like the highest level of perseverance ever yeah i love that yeah yeah right it doesn't make i don't know if you can make people tough uh you know as i look back you know what um kids that had dads that were wrestlers were often tough now i think even if they didn't wrestle and you know, play football they i think they were tough and then um i think military parents their kids have a – and maybe what is toughness? I think it's a blend of obviously discipline and just, you know, doing what's right when you're supposed to do it. Um, hey, you know, military parents, police officers, those kids seem to have that level of toughness to some level. But right. but if you look at their parents, that's who they are, right? So I don't know. Is it genetics? Uh, sure. Yeah, I would respectfully dis- disagree with that. I think that adults can learn to be tough, but – kids learn to be tough because they have so many repetitions, right? They're living yeah. with good models every day. Adults yeah, yeah. that want to become, or, or even young athletes that want to become tough, mm-hmm. they can do it, but they're usually working on it like an hour or two a day. They're not living with someone who is mentally tough, looking at that model, just being yeah. that way, you know? No, I agree. And, and you know what? The question is, is those adults, did they always have it? You know what I mean? And then they're just now aware and they bring it out. Right. Totally, you know what I mean? Totally. So you're sitting here going, and, and not that you can't get tough because I think it's just a state of mind. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell 100%. people I have, I have friends, like if you call them up, I use this example, you call them up, you said, Hey, we're going to go hunt uh, Moby Dick in a rowboat. Right. And and a majority of my friends would go, well, I'll pick up the tartar sauce on the way. Cause it's just assumed that we're going to get him. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. not going to, it's not going to be, Hey, you're crazy. It's going to be like, man, that's going to be fun. That's the type of, of, uh, mentality that I, I, I mean, I grew up with, with wrestling and football, right. It, it's just the way it was, right. you know, and, and that's just that mentality. And, and, and it gets greater. Like I've seen people individually that not maybe it's tough, but when they get with a group of people, it's that mob and, and that, that group mentality, right? Mm-hmm. And especially you put that group mentality through misery. 
because misery builds some level of camaraderie, right? Yeah. And I've seen that, hey, you get a group that you put through some misery and they get a level of camaraderie. Well, I just I was just able to see my we won a national title in 95 with my college wrestling team and I went back there. And uh, all those guys were there, most of them. You're sitting there going, hey, this is a group of, of awesome people. Why? Because what we went through, it was it was hard. And there's still that level of brotherhood after 20 years, right? You're just going, man. And, and you'd still go to work for those guys and do whatever you had to totally. do. Because you know they got your back the same way because of that mental toughness. So, And that to me, that's what's great about sports is that – I mean, sports, they're not that important, let's be honest with you, you know, with, uh, I mean, I, I teach people to lift dumbbells and run and jump higher. They, over there across the street here at the University of Minnesota, they're trying to find a cure for cancer. Right. You know what I mean? That's that's for real. But but sports are metaphors for life. I mean, they are, it's it's so many life lessons wrapped up into physical culture, in my long. opinion. That's why one of my kids involved with sports. Yeah. Because of that. Right. So... So how would someone use <clears throat> triphasic uh, in the sport of weightlifting? Uh, because usually, you know, most commonly, you do the explosive lifts first, right? You're going to jerk and snatch and clean first. Then you're going to do your kind of power lift. You're going to do the slower lifts. How would somebody use and maybe rearrange their day if they're technically sound, yeah. but they really just need to build absolute strength and, yeah. and power? Well, um, a number of coaches would use it. And again, we, I use the same format where, hey, you got to stop triphasic about six to eight weeks out before you, you know what I mean? Because weightlifting is such a skill. That's why they snatch every day when you're actually doing weightlifting competition. Um, now, I, I believe, and I've, I've tested it, that you don't really lose much strength for six to eight weeks in most cases, right? But the problem is with the snatch, if you don't snatch six to eight weeks, you may lose 20 kilos off your best right. snatch. So that's a skill thing. Now, the biggest thing I would assess if, if you're a high level weightlifter, and, and I know many that have used it, you would assess what your weak points are, and then you do your, your skill based movement. And then at the end, you would add maybe a triphasic phase into, let's say you need to do whatever lift your coach felt was the most important right? Whether to make you more powerful, or maybe it was a weak link of, of in a uh, weak link in some of your lifts, you would do that triphasically. That's the hopes. And then you would do that plenty of, of time out again, stop the triphasic about six weeks before mm -hmm. the competition so that you can develop that quality within that new lift. Cause let's say you get a, a, a lot stronger. What's going to happen is your lifts may not perform optimally until you learn the new skill with the new strength and the new qualities that you developed. Right. Um, you know, and the question always came with weightlifting. If you, if you really break weightlifting down, there was two concepts. There was, you do about three or four lifts, which was kind of the Bulgarian model, or you do the main lifts and then assisted exercises as support was more the Russian model and the Chinese model. I was fortunate to hear a Chinese weightlifting coach, um, um, talk before he, he he's kind of the father of Chinese weightlifting. I heard him talk down in Iowa, and this was a number of years ago. And he basically, when he went to Bulgaria and to Russia and to learn all this stuff, when Chinese started weightlifting and now they're dominating the world, as you know, right? Um, it, it basically came down to two things: either you do the main lifts and that's it, and then, or you do the 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 main lifts and then the assisted. And what they had happened was they had a guy that was close to setting a world record or he was up there. We well, hurt his wrist and he couldn't snatch until about four to six weeks out of competition. So they got a little worried if he could even compete, right? But what they did was they could do all these assisted lifts at, at, and really focus on them at heavy loads and high percentages, right? Or whatever loads they deemed. And they focused on those. And then... He practiced, started started training for the session, and he set a new world record about, you know, only training the lift about four to six weeks. And that's when they realized the assisted lifts were so important, mm -hmm. in their opinion, that they just couldn't focus on doing the big lifts, and that was it, right? right? And that's when I thought, well, for athletics and all these other people out there, I think in general, in most cases, at least during – before you get to really close to competition – 
variety of lifts are more important in my opinion because you really it just takes the weaknesses out of the body and then when you start to get dialed in and focus for a competition uh, and i'm sure you guys prepare people for competitions so they can be successful that they are able to perform optimally and they they, they drop the other lifts they don't need right. and work on this does that make sense yeah and you're and you're preventing overuse injuries and at the end of the day yes. your body doesn't really know a difference between like a clean and a sandbag clean and a safety bar. It, it just knows force production, right? Right. An extension, right? Right. It, it just knows that it's an extension movement yep. and it's a little bit different than if it's a sandbag than a bar. You know what I mean? So do the sandbags and everything else that you need to do on various days. But when you get close to competition, you got to stick to the, the lift itself. Right. Or, or the, the task at hand, I should say. So in the sport of fitness and CrossFit competition, every one of our tests is in the sagittal plane. And so thus, that's pretty much all everyone trains all year long. It's all linear. So we'd see a ton of overuse injuries. You train athletes who compete in every plane dynamically. Uh, so what are a few things that you're using that you think this population could, could use to train the frontal and transverse planes? Um, yeah, I, uh, I would guess big, I, biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. I mean, the hard part is like, I mean, I'll train, let's say like I'll, I'll do some running where they, they hook a band to themselves and we run straight ahead and the band's pulling to the side. So they stabilize and they move. I'll do a lot of plyometrics and jumps for my athletes to say, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, you can do lateral lunges with resistance. I think the big thing for me is when training these other planes that people actually lose focus of the stress that you need to apply so the, the more dynamic you make a lift sometimes the less stressful it is so then i i mean i don't want to get on a go on a tangent here but if you, if you look at the kettlebell swings i'm going okay it's, it's great for triple extension but so is an rdl and what one's going to give you more stress is the heavy bar loaded rdl or some kettlebell swings now i would do kettlebell swings in, in my weekly model i would do heavy rdls in the beginning of the week and when i'm tired and fatigued i do maybe the kettlebell swings at the end of the mm -hmm. week you know what i mean to build, build work capacity when we're tired um and then I think uh, I, I have some I do some lateral hip series that I think is is pretty big. But, you know, people talk about core training. And, and here's what I've realized that the core is actually hooked to the hips. And people talk about core bracing and everything. And I'm like, OK, but I found that um, if, if the hips aren't working correctly, then the core is never going to work correctly. And I think many people, I mean, this whole industry actually 15 years ago, they wrote books on quarter training and, and really they forgot about the hips because the hips are dysfunctional. If the psoas and the glutes aren't working correctly, the core can't stabilize itself. I'm talking a 300 pound lineman who if his glutes and hips aren't working correctly, then you can twist him and move him in any direction. But when his hips get turned on, guess what? Because the core stabilizes itself on the hips then the core instantly turns on correctly. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing. So um, with with uh, the plane training, I, I guess you can do whatever you want, you know, because we do a series of medicine ball throws or, uh, or, or just contralateral lifting. When I say that, like we may get on a reverse hyper and do a right leg um, reverse hyper movement or a one-legged, uh, let's say even one-legged lunge, and then we – we hold on with the other arm. So to me, the the, the transverse and, and all these planes, the, one, the biggest thing is called the lateral sling. So if that hip can stabilize as the right leg's on the ground moving something, and it can stabilize the upper body on the opposite side through the hips, then you have a more foundational and functional person to be able to stabilize and run and change directions, right. at least being an athlete. Um, and that that lateral sling is, is based upon the glute med, the absent contra, uh, uh, QL, and then the hamstring and the ab and abductors of the hip. Gotcha. So I, I interviewed Eric Cressy recently, and we talked about power development for kind of rotational athletes, rotational power, uh, or for, for developing rotational power. And he said, he, he, he just emailed me yesterday, actually, this study that showed zero correlation between uh, power development in the sagittal plane 
like a like a squat deadlift etc clean and the and the ability to rotate right so he found that the the he could get his pitchers uh, deadlift or clean pull up and it had zero effect on their ability to throw a baseball. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, so, so again, I'll, I'll go back to the rotational part, I guess when I agree, because a lot of times, let's say, for example, you have a pitcher who's running down the track at you and he's running with his arms out. To me, that's a sure sign. So, so why is his arms out? And, and what will happen is coaches will say, hey, you got to run with your arms in. And you just coached him to now run down the track hard with his arms in. When if you actually get the lat functioning correctly, because that lat is part of a stabilizer when you run. So when the, foot, the left foot strikes the ground, your arm will swing out on the right side because you can't stabilize your core. And that's actually a sign that the lat's not working correctly because that lat actually has to briefly turn on when the foot strikes the ground so that you can stabilize and you don't twist when you run. Okay. So I've seen, my point is, I guess I've seen huge power lifters or, or weight lifters who, who are, produce great amounts of power and force, but they can't change direction. They don't run very well. So they would never get the rotational force up because the sequencing of all the muscle firing mm -hmm. is completely wrong or inhibited because there's compensation patterns, right? So um, how I fix that is I, I use a RPR. It's called reflexive performance reset where I can just go in and hit, basically hit a reflexive uh, part of that lat and it turns it on. And now the next rep without coaching the kid, the kid runs at me with their elbows in. Now his power has went up because in that whole lateral sling, when I call lateral sling a rotation, the lat is tied to the QL, and this is a simplified version, then the glute, the opposite glute, and then hamstring, opposite glute med, and the ab and abductors of the hip, right? So if any one of those muscles are weak in that chain, you will hit your limits on how much rotational work can be done and how much power. Now then the other question becomes, if you can produce more in your hips, is the shoulder mobility. So, so the question I've always raised is that if I produce more power in the hips and I haven't trained the elbow to withstand more force, is this why we get some elbow problems? Because oh, the shit. tissue in the elbow hasn't been trained enough or correctly to withstand the new increase in force in the hips. Because where's, where's the force go? If the hips now produce more force, the kinetic change goes up through the torso, the shoulder gets cranked a little harder, and the elbow can be whipped a little harder. Now we might have a problem. Right. Makes so, sense? Absolutely. With all that in mind, do you, do you agree with his recommendation that someone like a pitcher who doesn't – they? they don't really do any line, like straight ahead forward sprinting, right? Because they don't mm -hmm. even bat a lot of times. Do you think yeah. it's even, um, do you agree with his recommendation that they shouldn't even do Olympic lifts? Well, I don't do a whole lot of them anyway. Okay. Because I, okay. to my opinion, I found, first my athletes didn't believe in them that much. So then I, I was like, I didn't want to have to sell them. But then, I, I mean, I've done it myself. I, I take all the, I take even the national uh, qualifier and weightlifting and have them do pyometrics and got way more power, way more effective. Now I love Olympic weightlifting. Like I'll have my son do it because I'll coach him every day. Right. right. For his next. So you have the decade. time to dial yes. in the technique. Yeah. 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 Um, but I got more effectiveness from the power and explosion from the, from plyometrics. And then if I need to get strong, I squat or hex deadlift or, or, right. you know, do those things or deadlift. And then if I need to get powerful and explosive, I can use wider, lighter weights on those or, or some form of plyometrics. If I got to get super fast, I can do whatever I need to do from plyos to bounding. to. So my thing is, is I'm trying to teach a nervous system to fire to higher another level. So I will actually still do sprints and plyometrics because in whole, to me, I've never seen an athlete that if everything's dialed in and every all the kinetic chains turned on, that if he gets faster one way, he doesn't get faster than the other. To me, if he's if he gets fast, if he gets faster linear, but doesn't get fast rotationally, we have a dysfunction somewhere in there that we need to make sure we test and readdress. Because once you get that cleared, that dysfunction in his rotational and, and lateral sling, then he will get faster. 
because the brain can send that signal. Uh, I'll give you a quick story when I realize this. I had, a, I had a hammer thrower. Well, I had a shot putter discus thrower walk into to college. He was benching 315 walking in the door. Superhuman freak, though. And when I say that, because he got way better, what happened was, I, I think I put a couple hundred pounds on his back squat. So when he walked in, he was benching 315. And in six months, they decide, well, they decided not to bench him anymore because that was a myth with the hammer throwers that you shouldn't bench press because it hurts the tightness of the chest. Well, he put a couple hundred pounds on his back squat in six months. And he's like, well, I'd like to bench and just see if I can bench the same because I haven't benched, right? He benched 365. Damn. Right? So that dawned on me at that point that, if you get stronger, more powerful with your legs and just the whole body from right. the brain sending the huge signal to the legs to get powerful, the rest of the body will get more powerful. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's very interesting. Yeah. And that's when I realized this whole thing, that was like 18 years ago. This whole thing is about the nervous system. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> because I've seen kids with very little muscle, extremely explosive and fast. And it's because their brain can recruit a lot of muscle fiber at one time. Yeah. So we, we were talking about acceleration training there a second ago. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like only in the past maybe 10 years, maybe even less, that the term deceleration training has become widely adopted. And I, I know a lot of what I would consider very high level strength coaches, like in terms of their job title. Yeah. that still have no idea what that word even means, right? They're, all they're doing is having people work on sprinting faster, but I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. What is deceleration training and why is it important? Well, deceleration is obviously when you go, after you've accelerated and you go to stop and the ability to withstand that force. Now we can get into the positional coaching of that, but uh, uh, that's not probably what we're gonna do here today, but the ability with that body, so when you plant that foot, and you lower your center of gravity to put the brakes on. And that's the big thing that we've seen with these, with uh, and people tell me with triphasic training, why does your pro agility, which is a five yard sprint this direction, 10 back and five the other way, why does that increase so much with triphasic? Because we've, uh, we've trained the eccentric focus. And that's the big deal with the deceleration is that when your muscle goes to stop, it can stop instantaneously. Now, if it, the faster it stops, I remind you, the greater the tendon is stretched and then it can reapply force. So really, if you stretch that tendon super fast and you have the ability to stop super fast, you actually get a return of free energy going the other way. So it's not as metabolically taxing. And it, I, I use the analogy here. If your muscle has to push you the other direction, it's like you pushing a sled. Or if your tendon does, it's like hooking up a bunch of bands to the sled, right. pulling it back, and letting that sled go, and a band slingshots you. Which one do you want to send that sled down faster? So so the big thing, and it's the same with uh, – and really where I, I came across it in triphasic training, I began to realize that I read a study where it was 5,000-meter runners – and world class, and they compared the world class five. I mean, world champion, Olympic champions to three th or to uh, the second level guys. They 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 analyzed VO two max, everything they could, strength. Nothing nothing came up with a statistical difference except the the guys that were second level world class runners. The hips started to undulate at three thousand meters. So what happens with that? And they didn't really explain this in the study. It was that. What's happening is that when the foot strikes the ground, the second level people would actually hips would drop. That then told me their muscles were had to push them for the last 2000 meters of the race where the world class guys hip didn't drop. The tendons pushed them through the wow. second part of the race and they got free energy. So they didn't ex the, the world class guys, the highest level ones didn't expend as much energy as the second level world class yeah. guys. So my point is, is that triphasic helps you increase that free energy return so you're less metabolically taxed. Got it? Love it. That's where the big difference is with triphasic. Let me ask you, have you, have you ever heard this, this analogy? So you can see me on Skype, I have my hand on my chest yeah. and you bring a finger back and then you just slam that finger back into your chest. So that's your muscle slamming into your chest and then yeah. the difference is if you pull your finger back then it just snaps back it. like a rubber band that, yeah 
That's a, that's a good one for the toolbox. That's the exact thing that we want. And with triphasic, you, you basically use the muscles when you stretch back, it makes that band tighter now. Right. And then the smackdown is even harder. Right. So you produce more power. That's the beauty, right? And, uh, and that's kind of some of the secrets to try. There is no secrets, really. It's all in the research and everything out there, right? But that's that's how I got lucky and stumbled upon triphasic and the results that I started seeing. Like, I tell people, I tried so much stuff over the years, and I just got lucky that I found triphasic before somebody else did, and that's all, you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the metabolic cost. So when, when kids would do a um, – whether it's a fitness test after they've done triphasic – and we didn't condition, they would get better on the fitness test. It's just because they're more economically sound and they're losing, using less energy to run the race or do whatever fitness test they were doing. I've heard you talk about some interesting things related to breathing. What are you yeah. teaching your athletes about the importance of breath and maybe even uh, give me some exercises that you're, that you're using? Yeah, so what we do is uh, we do a number of things. And honestly, I got a, a lot of it from the book Oxygen Advantage. And that, that book, uh, Oxygen Advantage, kind of helped me. And what I'll do is I basically, during our aerobic block phases, so when we first start training, we do an aerobic block where we keep our heart rate in aerobic zones. We don't go into lactate for a number of reasons. We're just trying to build the aerobic fitness levels. I mean, that helps in many cultures or many groups, whether you're old, young. If you can just get your aerobic base built up, it helps with insulin sensitivity, your ability to handle stress, um, hormonal profiles get way better um, the larger your aerobic base is. And then what we also do with that with the breathing is I'll actually tape my mouth, my kid's mouth shut during the course of the workout, and they learn to breathe through their nose. And why? Because um, there's a number of things that are going on. There's a vasodilation. So what that means is your blood vessels open up wider. And then you can do more work and stay in your aerobic zone longer. Um, you actually trade out good and bad products. You actually learn to utilize um, CO2 more effectively in regards to the bore effect, it's called. Um, and then you – because like a mouth breath – is a sympathetic breath and most of us have dysfunctional breathing patterns so i'm and pretty big a central in, nervous system thing right yes yes you're exactly right and the problem is when you breathe through your mouth um you have a uh it's a stressful breath and many people breathe with their chest so like my athletes get done with their exercises and they'll they'll get out of the exercise and they instantly hit a belly breath so for example one of my elite world-class wrestlers i mean he was at 180 190 beats 190 plus and in 35 seconds, he was down to 67 resting heart rate. Wow. So he went from like 190-something to 67. He get out of the squat rack doing heavy stuff, and boom. That's how fast he could control his breath. Now, we, we really focus on belly breathing. So like during the summer, a lot of our kids, they if they know the lift, we remind them. As soon as they get done, they hit a belly breath so they can – because what happens is then your heart rate drops – quickly why because you recover not because it's a trick it's because you're recovered and then what happens is you can actually do the same exercise again at a higher level faster and more effective and you can do more training because what happens is your heart and your body isn't as stressed in the workout if you're breathing correctly mm -hmm. and then you recover from the workout sooner and you regenerate. So one of the things I do recommend with a lot of my athletes is, and I've, I've literally checked heart rate variability throughout the night. I have devices that will do that. And if you tape your mouth shut during the night, nasal breathe, it is very, very effective. Oh, and recover. shit. So you, yeah. you've actually had people tape their mouths d during the night? Oh, yeah. I do. I do every night. You do it. Be yeah, because here's the deal. And actually, when I started doing that, I started dreaming more. Yeah, I started dreaming get, more, right? Get out of here. Well, think about this. If 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 you're if you're have a if you're breathing through your mouth and it's a stressful breath, it's a sympathetic breath versus or a stress breath versus a relaxed state breath. You breathe through your nose. So so like some of my athletes, even what we found is uh, when they started doing that, they they were ones that would be hydrated, but they get up in the middle of the night and, and have to use the restroom. Right. Well, when you tape your mouth shut, there's a antidiuretic supposedly released also, along with you know, the uh, nitrous oxide and you don't get up. They stopped getting up to use the restroom in the middle of the night because they hydrated so much. 
Wow. Right. So they don't, they, they, it all saves. It's an antidiuretic that's released. And then the other thing is, you know, it, it kind of came from, I think, like Winston A. Price and the, 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 the foundation he worked for, where they go to these places in tribal countries and they basically, people that they had normal breathing patterns, but they would be like, hey, we're here to do dentistry work. And these people had million dollar smiles and, and not many cavities or, or none. Well, the big thing you have to realize is if you sleep with your mouth taped shut or you're supposed to sleep with your mouth shut and you walked around like that, there's no oxygen in your mouth. So the development of cavities it's greatly reduced. So how do people that never brush their teeth not have teeth not have cavities? Mm-hmm. Right? So this all kind of and it really stems back from basically breastfeeding because we don't breastfeed till they're four or five years old to keep the babies alive, you know, in these these countries that are limited with resources and so forth. Right. So you wouldn't have to tape your mouth shut if you came from a third world country. Yeah. You can't you're not gonna you're not gonna make any money selling duct tape cal but if you create like a very (laughs) softly padded i don't know maybe there's like some crystals on the outside or something like that you could you could really really crush it well you go ahead run with it but you know i'm ultimately and the the one the only thing you got to worry about is obviously if if you have uh make sure you don't have heart problems with that for whatever reason but it actually helps people with uh some heart problems but you 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 may want to a doctor nor do you pretend to be one no, that's interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. I love that. And it's crazy for recovery because think about it. Your blood vessels are open throughout the night more. Your heart beat beats more efficiently and the tissues are healing now more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a quote. This is a little bit in a, in a different realm, but I'm, I'm hearing about, I mean, I, I've been very into meditation for 10 years. Um, yeah. I have, heard people from strength coaches start talking about it to people that that teach about language and our beliefs everyone is talking about the power of the breath and it's and it's now science is backing it up right it's not just some frou-frou spiritual thing so it's cool to see it like exploding in so many different areas because Mm -hmm. i think it's so fundamental to us as human beings not just to perform better but to have a better life (laughs) <laughs> well, look, every breath is a gift, right? I mean, that's what the, the and uh, if you don't like when people say, well, what? I'm a, I'm a world class sprinter. Why do I need to work on my aerobic base? Well, well, here's the deal. Hold your breath for five minutes. Let me see what happens. So every system in your body, even even strong power lifters, their system, the cretin phosphate phase recovers and regenerates itself with oxygen based concepts. Right. So, look, if you don't think that your utilization of oxygen and your breathing is 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 uh, important then you're crazy i've never like and, and the, it used to go like i used to do the all these things training my my throwers and my you know my elite level shot putters and we used to, then about 12 years ago it dawned on me so i gave it a shot we just did more weight circuits at the beginning we just do these circuit aerobic circuits at the beginning and uh, they actually got worse in their strength, right? But guess what? Four weeks after we stopped those, the strength levels all hit new high levels because their aerobic base was right. higher. Right. So that's why your aerobic base focus training work is capacity. a huge deal. Yes, work capacity and the ability to do more work. So you might take a step back, and you don't want to do that right before competition, right? But you want to. You may have to take a step back to make huge amounts of progress, and it might. It honestly. Here's what people find. It's the rate limiter. It's the one thing that if they were able to clear and get better, yeah. that they'll perform better later. Yeah. So it's really worth a two-week experiment to see if you can get better six weeks from now. So, yeah, what, what are a couple things that you have people do maybe in and or out of the gym that are uh, improving people's breath? Um, well, obviously, the big thing I'll do is so, – so, like um, – I do I do RPR and I have to disclose that I actually own the company, right? The Reflex Performance Reset. Got it. Um, these are just soft tissue. So I think the biggest dis- problem with the breath thing is there's a lot of companies out there that do the, the do breath. Um, and you have to coach people through all these breathing things. And, and with RPR, it's, it's not really the case. Basically, I've, we realized that all the fascia in your body in the front part gets all gunked up. 
So you can't breathe correctly. So what we do is we teach the athletes to release that fascia themselves. And what happens is when they release it themselves, just with their fingers, rubbing the areas that we tell them to, and we call it the Y, the upside down Y, what happens is the tissue releases and then they, a lot of them automatically, if they're not really bad, will, will shift into the belly breathing on their own. Okay. So by releasing that tissue, then the belly releases and all that tissue. And basically that's, that's helping the diaphragm function more, but, uh, you know, more complete and you're opening up the diaphragm and then the diaphragm does some amazing stuff, um, because it's, it's hooked to the pericardium of the heart too. So when you get that whole thing in the breathing, cause, cause like I've never seen somebody with a breathing pattern that's bad that actually hits the so or that actually has a so essence functioning correctly Got right it. and when i say that i mean when i say breathing like we, we focus on just pushing your your breath deep into your belly and because because actually if you look at it, if somebody's laying on the table and they're breathing deep into their belly their hips and their upper body rotate at the end of that breath so that's actually like a pumping action in the spine because if the hips move a little bit and the chest move a little bit at the end of the breath and then as they sag back together there's a pumping action that's going on. But if they're only chest breathing, then there's no pumping going on. So the the back can heal if you're be you know, if you're belly breathing, it'll actually go in and heal the tissue. Now, does that get rid of back problems? It'll get rid maybe get rid of back tightness, but it doesn't always get rid of your back problem. Yeah, it depends on the issue. But you know, ultimately, so the big thing is for us is that if you breathe correctly and you hit that thing ten thousand breaths a day or thirty or whatever, you're sitting here, you're going. Now you got a pattern that's that's more effective, right? And then when that pattern is right, then you start to heal and regenerate because basically what happens is you're sympathetic throughout the day. Your heart rate, your heartbeat, your your um, heart rate variability is uh, shortened, and when you're when you you have a bad breathing pattern. Love it, man. So yeah. uh, I've kept you over time. Um, I've got a couple questions about kids, or we can wrap it up. You got to roll. Whatever. No, we're good. Cool. So it was debunked years ago that kids shouldn't work out, right? For a long mm -hmm. time, it was, it was, we, we heard they shouldn't work out because they have growth plates and this and that. Mm -hmm. That's been debunked. Uh, with that said, what, what, what is an ideal that coaches and parents can shoot for when training kids? What are some of the guiding principles? Yeah, I think the big guiding principle, um, at least what I've done with my kids is they, one, I keep it fun, right? So, People ask me, what do I do, especially with my son? Um, my daughter sw is a swimmer, so she doesn't sprint f in front of people, right? Where my son plays hockey and lacrosse and football, and they're asking, well, what do you do? Well, you know, I put him through some basic sprint workouts, and, he and here it is, basically. I hate sprint workouts, so they're boring. So what I do, I just line him up, and I look at him, and I'm like, all right, run a post. And I grab a football and we throw it and I throw it too far. Yep. So he has to run really fast to get underneath it. Right. And that's sprint number one. And then he walks back and he tells me how bad of a quarterback I am. And then we stand there during the rest period and we throw the football back and forth. Jeez. He may throw left handed. He may throw right handed. So for a minute and a half, we rest. And then he goes back over and he runs another pass pattern. And this time it might be up the hill in the yard, wherever. I don't care what you do, but he runs it as fast as he possibly right. can, right? So he runs six of those with the rest period. And then after that, we just we just play. Yep. But that's that's because here's the key to that. What people don't realize is you have to do quality work to get better and faster. Speed kills, right? So like I can get anybody fit. Like fit, fitness is easy. That coveted quality is speed. Right? So that's how I and literally I I trained him like that for the whole summer one day, every day. And everyone says, oh, you, you might overtrain him. Well, if he's a world-class sprinter and you sprint every day, yeah, because his nervous system can tune the body up and he's going to be tacked. Yeah, my son 15 at years 10, to get there, right? It, my son at 10 years old's nervous system is not going to generate that much force or, or that much power. So, no, he was never fatigued. And I actually checked him with my Omega Wave. So, he was fine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, you're like, I just would run six to eight high-quality sprints, and then we just went and played. Right. And that's it. Right. So that's the big thing, I think, because parents want to go and want their kids killed or they want them to come out with sweating. That's fine. But if your kid needs to get faster, he may not go and get super sweaty. Understand that there needs to be a difference. So, yeah, if your kid's fitness levels are hurting, then he might no need to go and get get. Uh, 
you know, worked out harder. But to, to me, it takes years to develop that speed, especially right. through those developmental years, right? And I knew, like, I'll send my son to, to other people to train when, when it's time for fitness. But when it's time for high-quality stuff, he stays with me, and this is what we do. Yeah. And he's like, Dad, I'm not tired. I'm like, I know. That's okay. We're here to get faster. You know what yeah, I mean? Let, let's highlight this, too, because, yeah, I don't know how – I don't know how many just kind of normal parents will make it this far into the interview after all of that nitty gritty stuff. But right. in case they are, uh, to build speed, you have to rest completely in between reps. If you're breathing hard still, you're probably, you probably need to rest a little bit longer. Yeah. You can't repeat the effort that, that was just fast, right? You can't repeat that first one. And why do people say, well, why, why six or eight? I'm like, because after six or eight, I've timed my son, I've timed the elite athletes they all start to drop off yep. and that's where we're done we just move on to the next thing right and then it just takes longer to recover if you yeah. keep going it, you're not getting anything out of it and it right. takes you longer to recover exactly anything else uh yeah. any, any other big guiding principles about maybe movement patterns or even things to not do um you know i, I uh i think with parents uh in regards to the movement pattern if, if you got a kid at a young age, I think the more, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I go back, to be honest with you, some of the kids that I've dealt with that are wired, and I got one now that's amazing. I've never seen anybody like her. She's a female. And again, I don't know if she'll make the Olympics because I've I had, uh, I think, 10 kids in the Olympics last in hockey um, that I've worked with in the last uh, in the last Olympics. But gymnastic kids, when they were young, those kids are there's something about them. And I mean, this girl that I have now, and again, she, I don't know if she'll make the Olympics. She's got to know the game, right? Too. That's the great thing about hockey. You also have, you can have speed, power, and strength, but if you don't know the game, you're just going faster in the wrong spot, yeah. right? I mean, that's it. Um, gymnastics scene. So, so do you have to have a gymnastics? No, but I'm telling you play at the high, you know, just changing up the play. Right. Um, you know, go play with them, give them things to play with. I think like growing up, like right now, my kids at eight, nine, 10 love spike ball. I think that's a great game. Dude, Where, I love you know spike I mean? ball. Yeah. Right. I love it. <laughs> just, just anything that gets a move in hand, eye coordination right. for me is the biggest thing because the more things you can connect, the more pathways, it just basically helps them develop. And, and like you're sitting here, you're going, okay, even if my, Let's say one of my kids, like, I don't, I know they're not going to be an elite level athlete because that's not their interest. But if they develop more of those pathways, will it avoid them from getting in a car accident when they get older because they can react sooner? You know, mm -hmm. that's, those are life long. Your body's more resilient. Yeah, your body's more resilient. You can react better. They have skills that, that they can maybe save their life is, is what I'm saying. You know what I mean? And that's the big thing. And it connects them. And this is one of the most, most undervalued parts of it um so I, I grew up in the south and so everybody plays sports man everybody plays right. sports and then i lived in the west for a long time and i and i saw a lot of people you know as we start hearing about more concussions and all of this a lot of people just saying um they're absolutely not going to allow their their kids to do football but even really just shying away from athletics and putting way more emphasis on developing their kids intellectually which is obviously super valuable but they miss out on teaching their kids how to like be in their bodies and really embody activities which is something that helps us just enjoy life it helps us have less stress and all of those other things that you're talking about like building resiliency yeah and there's no question I, and and but the, i think there's plenty of research out there saying that the more the more you develop physically the more upswing and and so if you can merge those two together to be right. optimal that's what you want you know what i mean there's no doubt because um i mean kids that are not allowed to move um that don't get touched a lot they you know there's developmental problems there so um you know old folks are finding yeah i can if if they do if they're more active they're they're more alert they, you know they need to walk and do the crossword puzzles and things like that right, right. They, they need to do both things um yeah i just uh and let kids play and run man that's that's the big thing hell yeah all right man let's wrap it up all right. you've got a new youtube page where you're uh, putting out some very high quality videos. Tell us about that. Tell us about the books, all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, I have triphasic. I released that and I have a few manuals and I'm, I'm working on a, the GPP training, which is basically your general developmental phases before you go to train. Um, 
the various things that I have, and I, I'm uh, hopefully by the end of the summer I'll have YouTube of summer of two eighteen. I'll have the uh, triphasic training two done. Um, I'm working on a few other things. I have uh, my reflexive performance reset, which kind of got in the way in a good way. Uh, it basically um, takes all this therapy stuff or concepts out of the practitioner model and hand it to the athlete so the athlete can take care of themselves. I have people come to Minneapolis and awesome. I teach them it and then they leave. Yeah. So, um, I have a lot of things going on, but you know, ultimately it's, uh, I'm just, I'm here to be a coach and, but all this development stuff of myself helps me be a better coach. So I got to find that happy medium to make sure I keep, uh, I keep uh, progressing and, and trying to give my kids here at the university of Minnesota, the best, uh, the best I can. Hell yeah. Um, and, and for those out. listening, triphasic the, the triphasic books are something that if you don't have like a deep understanding of exercise science or kinesiology, it can actually play a really big part in like giving you a base because a lot of the book is talking about the foundations of exercise science before it gets into like what sets triphasic training apart. So it's a, yes. it's a great, great resource. Oh, yeah. Where can they find all of that? What's your website? Uh, main website is xlathlete.com. So it's like extra large athlete.com. And that's the that's the basis where everything's at. I just revamped it. So it's still going through a little bit of, you know, I had 40,000 redirects on it. So it was a little bit much there. So gotcha. Gotcha. my web guys were a little pulling their hair out over yeah, me, but man. that's all right. So um, no, but that's where they can find information and, and uh, probably some resources for themselves. Awesome. Cal, right. thanks again, man. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, I really appreciate this. This was killer. Hey, thanks for having me. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW. 